Good morning. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Stephen Bayens. I am the Commissioner of the Iowa Department of Public Safety, and by extension, I oversee the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation. Uh, as we be begin today's press conference, uh, the Department of Public Safety wishes to express its appreciation to the Dallas County Attorney's Office for the report that they released yesterday. Uh, I can confirm that the factual statements contained in that report are accurate and consistent with our investigation. Second, I think it's important to note that the county attorney's findings were shaped through the lens of determining criminal liability. As a result, certain facts that didn't bear on that decision were not likely included. Third, the investigation conducted by the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation was purely criminal in nature. It was not an audit or a review of the processes or the response by any party during the shooting or in the aftermath. Finally, I think it's important for everyone to understand why and why not certain things will be discussed today. We will do our best to provide the answers that we can to provide some closure, to provide some understanding about what happened on January 4th in Perry. But by the same time, I'm not going to share certain details that some of you may hope to have. And the reason for that is fourfold. First, there are existing privacy and confidentiality laws that limit our, our ability to discuss some of these things. Second, the threat of copycatting or mimicking behavior is real. Uh, and in fact, it played out in this case. And so we will not be revealing security matters, operational tactics used by law enforcement or the shooter to accomplish this in an effort to prevent future school shootings. Third, as you will hear later in my words today, the shooter in this case desired notoriety. And I am not inclined to be a tool to further that end. Finally, I'm not going to dishonor the families of Amir Joliffe, Principal Dan Marburger, and the rest of the victims in this case by glorifying a day of evil. So that is why you may not hear the details you desire. With those things in mind, however, I would like to begin with kind of the nature and the extent of the investigation undertaken by the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation. First and foremost, the agents, the criminalists, the analysts that worked on this, app, this investigation absolutely poured their hearts and souls into it. I know the toll it took on them. It took a toll on them physically. It took a toll on them emotionally. Uh, I could see it in their eyes. But they carried on. And, and they carried on because um, they have a calling to pursue justice, and that's what they did. But make no mistake about it, um, it takes a toll on us to do this work, um, and our folks did it heroically. They worked for hours and hours. The number of hours they poured into this case was staggering. I know one agent alone worked in excess of 200 hours just on the video from the school. The tenacity they showed was inspiring. This investigation ranks among the most exhaustive and complex investigations the DCI has undertaken in its 100-year history. All told, more than 180 people were interviewed. Agents reviewed literal terabytes of digital evidence. They spent hours and hours on video footage. There was meticulous crime scene processing. They executed multiple search warrants obtained prosecuting attorney subpoena records, or records, excuse me, and documents. They performed a full and complete scrub of the shooter's digital and social media. The agents of the DCI turned over every conceivable stone they could, searching for answers. And I stand here as their commissioner incredibly proud of them, and I want to thank them for their work. So as we turn from the investigation, the breadth of it itself, um, I'm going to attempt to uh, at least answer 
probably the three most pressing questions um, that may still exist. And the first is, is on everyone's tongue, and it's the why. Um, what was the motivation behind this shooter? What I can say broadly is that school shooter motivation tends to fall into one of three broad categories. That first category is that it is driven by ideology, that is ideologically motivated in some fashion, meaning that the shooter had a belief system and was trying to carry that belief system out. The second is that it was grievance-based, that the shooter had a sense that he had been wronged either justly or unjustly, real or in his mind, and that he was carrying out the shooting to exact revenge for that grievance. And the final is that he was simply suicidal, that he was suicidal coupled with a homicidal intention to take others with him in an effort to gain notoriety. While it's difficult to delve into the mind of a school shooter, all the available evidence points towards this shooter being in the suicidal category. With regards to ideology, there is no evidence that this shooter held a tight belief system. And in fact, all the evidence shows that this shooter was disjointed, fractured, and inconsistent in thought. There was no theme that ran through this from a belief system standpoint. And in fact, um, for all intents and purposes, this shooter was a walking contradiction. Second, with regards to grievance, there was no evidence to substantiate any claim of bullying or the existence of a substantive grievance that, grievance that existed. And that brings us uh, to the final, which is that he was, in fact, suicidal with homicidal intentions. There is significant evidence of this shooter's fascination with prior school shootings. There is evidence of, copy hat, of copycat behavior from the school shooter regarding prior school shootings where significant details reside in the public domain. The shooting was indiscriminate. The victims were not targeted and appeared to be product, and appeared to have been a product of immediate availability. There was evidence of meticulous, week-long planning rather than an unprepared emotional response. Finally, he said as much in his own hand. We recovered write-ins from the shooter who indicated just that. He desired to be famous. He desired to commit suicide. He desired to take others with him. He told us as much, and that is the best evidence that I have of his intentions. The second question is the origin of the firearms and the improvised explosive devices recovered from Perry that day. The primary weapon used in this shooting was a 20-gauge Remington 870 shotgun. There were significant investigative efforts made to identify the source of the shotgun. I can say that agents were able to trace the original purchaser of that shotgun, and it happened roughly 20 years before the shooting. We traced it through successive purchasers where we could, uh, but eventually that shotgun was sold in a private sale, and at that point in time, the trail went cold. The last time we could put that shotgun in a particular person's hand was roughly 10 to 15 years prior to the shooting. That being said, we can say that the shotgun did not come from the parent's home. But the best available evidence that we have, although it is not confirmed, is that the shotgun likely came from a large gun collection within the extended family, and that the shotgun was likely taken without the owner's knowledge. With regards to the Ruger 22 caliber revolver, we can say that that revolver was legally purchased by the shooter's father in 2020. The investigation revealed the revolver was unsecured in the family home. Further, there was evidence that there were ongoing conversations within the family suggesting the shooter's ability to access it. It is important to note, however, that the revolver itself was not used in the shooting. It was merely on his person at the time of the shooting. Finally, with regards to the improvised explosive device, 
the device was rudimentarily made. It was not particularly complex. It did not show a high degree of engineering. It was fairly simple, um, involved the use of generally commercial grade fireworks and some other things. Um, there is all indications is the shooter himself constructed it. Our state fire marshals bomb squad took a look at that device and determined that had it been detonated, uh, it would have had a negligible impact on the surroundings. The third question that tends to be on everyone's mind is who knew? Were there red flags in this case? And I can say that there was no evidence that any other person knew of the shooter's specific intentions on January 4th. That being said, I can say that others were aware of the shooter's general interest in school shootings. Others were aware with his, of his fascination for violence. Others were aware of his concerning behaviors. The evidence bears that out. Those concerns, along with, another, with a number of other warning signs, were unreported or were otherwise unrecognized. But we can say that the shooter in this case did have broad behavioral issues, had broad mental health concerns, and that many of these concerns were present years in advance of the shooting on January 4th. There were no prior reports of concerns of violence to law enforcement, whether that be state, local, or federal. I think this is the time maybe to talk just briefly about um, what we know about school shootings and prior knowledge of it. Um, the United States Secret Service conducted a study a number of years ago that found that 80% of school shootings, in 80% of school shootings, one or more persons had some level of knowledge that should have raised concerns. Uh, I can say categorically in this case that this case bears that out, that there were individuals that knew information that should have generated concerns. It should have elevated those concerns to the point of contacting law enforcement, school officials, or someone else. The evidence confirms that the shooter demonstrated what experts call, commonly call is a pathway to violence. That first step in that pathway to violence generally is ideation. What ideation is, is recurring thoughts, fantasies, or an obsession with acts of violence or the use of violence. That is ideation. There is evidence in this case that the shooter had that ideation, that he was fascinated, that he was obsessed with violence, with prior school shootings, and that that sort of ideation had presented a year or more in advance of January 4th. Second, on that step, that pathway to violence is planning. Planning is kind of that movement from a generalized thought process to kind of the who, what, where, and how of executing that fascination out. Uh, we can say that there is evidence that would show that there was a dramatic shift in this shooter's thinking from ideation to planning, and that shift in thinking occurred six or more weeks advan in advance of the shooting. The third step in that pathway is preparation that there were concrete efforts to put that plan into action. That sort of preparation may include acquiring weapons or modifying weapons, uh, practicing, desensitizing oneself to violence, or identifying potential barriers. Again, there was substantial evidence of preparation in this case, and that preparation occurred at least one month in advance of the shooting and continued up until the day of the shooting. And then the final step in that pathway to violence is implementation, and that is actually carrying it out. And clearly in this case, the shooter did carry it out. So those are the three kind of salient questions that we've heard time and again. Uh, a couple of other matters that I'd like to discuss with you in our short time is to talk about the response. Uh, I can tell you that the staff and students responded appropriately and heroically. They self-evacuated like they should. They found secure locked locations like they should. And those that found those safe, secured, locked locations were safe. Those that self-evacuated were safe. They performed as they should and acted in their own self-interest as they should. 
The school staff was trained in active shooter response by the Dallas County Sheriff's Office and acted in conformance with that training. I'm going to call a couple of folks out from the Perry School staff in particular. Uh, Assistant Principal Brad Snowgren is a hero. Um, Assistant Principal Snowgren was the one that activated the school safety radio within that first 10 seconds. I can tell you that he was actively avoiding gunfire and trying to make his way to the principal's office to, act, to hit, the, hit the button, to turn that radio on, to give Dallas County Sheriff's Office notice. Uh, it was heroic and it was intentional on his part. Um, one of the other true heroes, obviously, that we all know is, is Principal Dan Marburger. Um, and he was heroic as well. Um, I can tell you that he saved lives that day. He called the shooter by name repeatedly. Dylan, don't do it. Dylan, stop. Dylan, let's talk. After being shot more than once. And in part, why that's important is it's not so much the empathy that Marburger showed towards the shooter, but every time he called that name out, the shooter heard his name, and he looked and turned towards the sound, and when he did that, it diverted his attention from who he was intending to shoot. And each time Principal Marburger called that name out and diverted that attention, it bought those students another two seconds, another three seconds, another five seconds. And when we're talking about school shootings, those sorts of seconds matter. And in this case, they did matter. And it made sure that those kids got out of that commons area, around the corner, and off to safety. He was an absolute hero. Next is the law enforcement response. Um, as noted, Perry Police Officer Michaela Zager was inside the school two minutes and 59 seconds after the Sears radio was activated. Michaela Zager is a lion. She got out of her squad car with just a handgun went through those doors. She did not wait for backup. She did not wait for a supervisor. She was through those doors, and she was there to protect the kids inside. That is exactly what we expect our law enforcement officers to do, and the community of Perry should be extremely proud of Michaela Zager. She did not wait. She did not pause. She did not take account of her own safety. She went headlong in to try to find that threat and did exactly what she was supposed to do. The other part that I think really gave me pause in seeing the body cam footage of what happened inside Perry is once those officers were in, um, you could see it in their eyes, they were fierce protectors. They were going to protect those kids, they were going to do their duty they were going to find that threat. They were going to stop that threat. And you could see the steely reserve in their eyes. 100%. And when they finally determined that that threat no longer existed and that the shooter take, took his own life, the switch in those officers was immediate. They went from fierce protector to caretaker in a snap of a finger. It, it was remarkable. Um, it's remarkable to see folks that can go from a lion to a lamb, go from willing to take a life if they have to, to do everything in their power to preserve it. Um, that is remarkable. Uh, I get a little choked up even playing that scene through my mind again here today. Um, but we should be incredibly proud, proud excuse me, of our police officers for their ability to do that and the compassion that they show in the midst of horrible circumstances. So 
I, I want to spend just a few moments just talking about kind of what our statewide response has been to school safety. Um, obviously, the Governor's School Safety Bureau was initiated um, a number of years ago, and I just want to give everyone a little bit of a sense of, of kind of where things stand in that regard. Um, to date, um, 5,386 teachers and civilians have received civilian response to active shooter trainings, uh, and there are five current classes scheduled. Additionally, 3,731 civilians and educators and first responders have received Stop the Bleed training on how to provide immediate first aid, with seven additional classes scheduled in the near future. 1,484 law enforcement officers have gone through active shooter training, and there are four additional classes scheduled. Additionally, uh, the Iowa Department of Public Safety's Division of Intelligence have been tracking school safety threats and providing investigative assistance since that time. Uh, since that inception, they have tracked 325 school safety tips that were received outside the safe and sound reporting platform and tracked 530 within that platform. The Governor's School Safety Bureau made uh, school safety radios available to any school that wants them. Uh, to date, 1,253 school radios have made their way to those individual schools. An additional 207 are on order, bringing that total to well over 1,400 radios provided to those schools. Additionally, the legislature impaneled a task force uh, to examine uh, physical hardening of schools, uh, to put together a report of concrete recommendations to schools in terms of investment of monies to make schools more safe. Uh, that task force is ongoing and they're expected to have a report to the legislature in December of this year. Uh, turning to the future, one of the things that we're excited to continue to explore is the use of multidisciplinary threat assessment teams. Um, for those of you that don't know what that is, they're used in, in some districts in the state already, but they're also used across the nation. But it's an opportunity to bring law enforcement, school officials, counselors, juvenile court officers, uh, folks from different walks of life that see different aspects of kids and bring them together. And if there is an individual that has concerning behaviors, they can look at that child holistically. Uh, they can assess potentially where on that pathway of violence that child may be and have concrete interventions and provide off ramps for that pathway of violence to get them the help they need kind of prior to any sort of law enforcement intervention. In closing, I just want to talk about just the pain that we feel for the families of Amir Jolif, for Principal Dan Marburger, the six other victims in the Perry community. Our heart goes out to them. This is an unspeakable tragedy. I can say that I was inside Perry High School on January 4th, uh, shortly after the shooting. Um, I walked the halls of that school. Uh, I saw the carnage that that day produced. Um, and I can tell you it left an indelible mark on my soul. And that is not something, um, as the commissioner, as a parent, as a dad, that I ever want to relive again. And so that brings me, I guess, to kind of my closing thoughts. And um, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to take off my commissioner hat and I'm going to put on my dad hat. But really what we need to do to address these school shootings is a holistic approach. And really, when we look at it, you know, it, we need to have a series of concentric protective circles. And what I mean by that, at the center of that circle, it, it has to be parents. They know their kids best. Parents need to be involved. Willful blindness is not a parenting strategy. You need to be engaged. You need to be in your kids' lives. You need to set duration and content moderation on their digital devices. You need to know who their friends are. You need to be nosy. You need to go through their room. 
they're your kids, you have the right to do so, please do so. With that, if you ever get to a moment where you're looking at a, your teenage son or daughter and you can't see the bright smiling four-year-old that used to play in the backyard and you don't recognize the face across from you, there's a problem. You need to intervene. If you have a child in crisis, you need to protect protective members measures. You need to secure firearms. You need to get firearms out of the home until that is resolved. You need to be a parent. And that next concentric circle of protection is friends, acquaintances, co-workers. Uh, when we experience, and, and investigators experience what's called leakage, which means that information got out somewhere, like ideation, uh, it usually happens at that level. It happens among friends, it happens among coworkers, it happens uh, among acquaintances, and we can say that in this case, that leakage occurred. This shooter told friends about his fascination for violence. Uh, this shooter told people online about his fascination with school shootings. That leakage occurred, and we need to get to a place where we are comfortable reporting those concerns. Um, we have been conditioned a little bit to be polite, I think, at times, not wanting to offend, not wanting to be a snitch, whatever you want to term it, but we have been conditioned not to share those concerns. Um, if I have one thing to implore you is share those concerns, share it with the teacher, share it with law enforcement, share it through the Safe and Sound app, um, because I can tell you as a member of law enforcement, I am okay with apologizing for a misunderstanding. What I am not okay with is standing in front of a mom who just lost their son or daughter to school violence. I will apologize all day long for a misunderstanding. I don't want to be in that position again of having to stand across from a parent because someone was too polite to say something. That next concentric circle is our institutions, our schools, um, our houses of worship, our places of employment, um, and I completely understand the educational mission. We need to invest in our kids. We don't want any kid to fall through the crack. We want to provide resource after resource to make those kids successful and well-adjusted and, and well-educated. Um, but we also have to be mindful when there is a child in crisis, they present a risk. And we have to be willing to evaluate the risk that that individual child poses to the rest of that community. And we have to ask those hard questions. We have to engage those threat assessment teams. And the desire is to address those behaviors early, find a, something less than a law enforcement intervention, get them counseling, get them whatever else they need, and divert them away and off of that path from violence. And that final concentric circle is law enforcement. Um, but I have. I need to be realistic. Um, if we get to the point where we're at that concentric circle, we are far down that pathway to violence. Um, law enforcement will show up. We will do what we need to do. But by the time it makes it to us, if we don't hear about it in advance, the margin to prevent these things is extremely thin. Um, so we will continue to do our job. But by the same token, it has to be, it has to be a holistic effort. So with that, um, I am willing to take uh, some questions with the caveat and the reminder of where I started, which is there are certain things that I will not talk about, and I will remind you of the reasons why. Um, just going back real quick on the weapons, uh, will anybody be held liable for the weapons that were used in the shooting? Uh, our role was to investigate the facts and circumstances. Um, we presented that uh, complete investigative report to the Dallas County Attorney's Office. Uh, that is their providence and their decisions to make, and so I can't comment on that liability uh, because it's outside our area of responsibility. Awesome. Um, I also have another one. A uh, victim's mother told me that law enforcement DCI agents had told her while her son was in the hospital that there may have been another person involved in the shooting and gave, in her, gave her names. Is that true? And how can you reassure her that Dylan Butler acted alone? She is incorrect. Um, and I don't, 
and I'm not suggesting that she's being untruthful. Um, what I am suggesting is what tends to happen in the aftermath of these, they are chaotic, it's emotional, it's hard to at times process information. Um, and what I suspect happened here is that she thought she heard something, um, but she did not, she misheard it to the extent that she did. Um, but I can say definitively, going back to the investigation, every person we interviewed, every petabyte, every gigabyte, of every byte of digital information that exists does not suggest that there was another person involved. Ms. Mack, the yes. Dallas County Attorney's Office indicated that the shooter posted on social media when, when the incident began and also started live streaming the event. Are you able to say where those posts were and, and how long that live stream was up for? He, he live streamed it on Instagram. Um, it was up for a very, very short period of time. Uh, I don't believe we even have any evidence to suggest that he did not have a broad following, so it's very unlikely that anyone necessarily saw it. Um, one of the things that we do is we work with our social media companies very actively, um, and within minutes of that going live, um, Meta, who owns Instagram, immediately took it down. We worked with then Meta to obtain the loan copy of it and then ensured that it never saw the light of day again, um, at least in the public sphere. Can you describe the interactions that Butler had with the school prior to the shooting or several other times? Um, we can say that there were, there were documented behavioral issues in school. Um, beyond that, I can't go into much detail. There are certain privacy laws, FERPA, and those that would prevent us to talk further, but I can say that there were behavioral issues in the school prior. Uh, can you say how many years? Was it like from the beginning of this high school? Um, I can say that those presented in at least a year or more. Commissioner, you talked about the weapon that he had on him but didn't use in the shooting and that it was not um, kept safe. I'm searching for the right word, but it was not kept safe in the home and there were conversations surrounding his accessibility to that weapon that wasn't used. Can you talk about those conversations and what exactly you meant by that? I can say that there was some clear discussions broadly in the home about where the firearm was, um, where it was located, that in particular it wasn't secured in any particular location, it wasn't in a gun safe, there wasn't a gun lock on it, you know, those sorts of things, um, and that there were suggestions that the shooter had knowledge of that and that there was immediate availability to that weapon as well and that there was some level of um, agreement in the family that 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 accessibility occurred. So people are gonna wonder, could his parents face charges for that? And again, our role is to provide the investigative facts to the Dallas County Attorney, um, and that is part of their decision-making rubric about what qualifies from an evidentiary standpoint, from a legal standpoint, uh, to warrant charges. Commissioner, yes, you sir. mentioned that some people ahead of time knew about this. Uh, can you characterize one or two, several, and why these folks didn't offer this information? Is there any, any kind of background on that? Yeah, I can say, when, and, and to be clear, when they say knew about this, they did not know th that he was going to commit a shooting. Um, what they knew was about his fascination for violence. Um, what they knew is he had in stated interest in prior school shootings. Um, we can say that some of those conversations happened online um, in the sense of, of chat rooms and those sorts of things. Um, we were able to uh, use some of our uh, federal partners to make interviews and contact with those individuals that were in those chat rooms in other states. Um, I mean, the common reoccurring theme was, in retrospect, in hindsight, I should have said something. At the time, it was an interest in true crime, uh, those sorts of things. Um, there was also some personal interactions here, you know, within the Perry community. Um, and much kind of the same is, you know, there was discussions about fascination and violence, school shootings, um, but again, kind of going back to, well, we just never thought he'd act upon it. Sort of in the realm leading up to this morning, did you wrestle with whether sharing maybe some more specific findings from your investigators could produce a light bulb moment for educators and families? Like, oh, that is a certain kind of thing that I've heard from this person, or is it pretty clear the balance of yeah, and I think that was the design today. 
um, was to try to provide those clues so there's a there's an, a parent there's a teacher there's someone there going okay what has changed in my child's behavior or what am i seeing in this child that's different you know if we're going suddenly seeing behavioral outbursts if you're seeing you know a stark change in um, potentially how they dress if you're seeing kind of those outbursts if you're seeing kind of this fractured thought processes and ideology um, you need to make yourself aware of those things um, and report them. Um, do Butler's parents say that he had outbursts? Uh, all of those concerning behaviors we previously mentioned, um, all the evidence suggests the parents were aware of those as well. This is a really high profile case, of course, but on a day to day basis in DCI, is it unusual to run into that kind of dead end tracing weapon? It happens with a fair degree of frequency. Um, because there is a point in time where if you transfer a weapon between private parties, uh, then the ATF does not necessarily trace that pathway. Um, so that does happen on occasion. We traced it every time it, it made its way through a federal firearms licensee. Um, but once it was sold or, or gifted to someone in a private sale or private gift, then that, that trail runs cold. Last question. There is. It has been incredibly challenging. Um, you know, I, I talked about kind of that mo emotional and physical toll on the investigators. Well, our school safety folks have felt that as well here in the last couple of months. Um, we went through about a two or three week stretch where we were averaging five a day. Um, and the best way I can kind of liken it is at times it feels like, like if you have a pile of tinder and you have a hundred people running with matches towards it, and you're trying to figure out which one is serious and which one is just pretending. But you gotta try to blow all of them out. Um, that's incredibly challenging. Um, it's really hard. But you have to run every single one of them to ground. Um, and yes, the vast, vast majority of these were hoaxes, cries for help. Um, very, very few would suggest that they were actually on that pathway of violence. But I can tell you, within this school year alone, there have been a handful that were on that pathway. And that the Safe and Sound app, um, other reporting, uh, allowed law enforcement to become involved and start trying to find those off ramps to that pathway to violence. Commissioner, just one more question. Yeah. On that It's, it's hard to say. Um, you know, I think we, we learned a lot just from the standpoint of it kind of translated to kind of head knowledge to heart knowledge. Um, you know, we knew kind of what school shooters, how they present, we knew the research behind them, um, but we never experienced it. Uh, I think one of the other things that we learned is that um, we can only do so much. And I think that's probably kind of the reoccurring theme a little bit is that that realization that it can't just be us. Um, and in reality, when it, when it is us, nine times out of 10, it's, it's in a scenario where it's now a crime scene. And we're there to mop up the carnage. And just like willful blindness isn't a parenting strategy, that is not a school safety strategy. Um, the school stra safety strategy has to be holistic. We need parents, we need teachers, we need friends, um, and we need those partnerships if we're going to prevent this. Because that's the reality is, you know, we believe that that's where our effort should lie is in prevention. And what that reiterated and what this situation reiterated was that is exactly where we need to be is prevention. Um, because response and mitigation, this entire shooting event took four minutes and 21 seconds.
I mean, four minutes and 21 seconds. Law enforcement was notified within the first 10 seconds. A police officer was physically inside the building in two minutes and 59 seconds. That is a blink of an eye. And that is not a strategy. Thank you.